Welcome to Good Life. I'm Dean Wilson. So glad you joined us. You can always find us at goodlifetelevision.org where we have these great interviews. The, the full form interviews are there as well as power clips from those interviews. And we hope you'll enjoy it. We, we are also on all the social media platforms and we're really here uh, to talk about the good stuff, to inspire and encourage and empower. And uh, we have a wonderful guest with us today. Uh, Terrence Lester is with us. Terrence is the founder of Love Beyond Walls. Uh, he's in Atlanta, Georgia. Terrence, welcome. Hey, Dean. Uh, it's great to be here. How's it going? We're good. We're great. I, I have so enjoyed over the last couple of days uh, reading about you and reading about your story. But and I want to get to a lot, but but start with kind of just you your your upbringing. Yeah, are you from Atlanta or where'd you grow up? Yeah, I'm actually uh, a native of Atlanta, Georgia. I've been here my entire life, which is very rare because Atlanta is known for its transplants. Um, people are here from all over claiming Atlanta as home, and so yeah, I've been here my entire life. And now you had an experience when you were 16 that I was reading about that were, and I, I mean, uh, I, it sounded to me like you were essentially homeless or, or kind of moving around. What, what happened to you when you were 16? Yeah, sure. Uh, when I was 16 years old, uh, I left home, ran away from home, and um, I had a, a window where I was like literally sleeping from park to park and from friend's house to friend's house and just really trying to figure out um, uh, my identity, uh, trying to make sense of uh, my, my social context um, related to my family. And I had a friend whose father came into my life early on. Uh, his name was Mr. Moore. And Mr. Moore became a mentor to me. And he would uh, call out the good things in me. Um, he would uh, talk to me about my future and he would encourage me to think larger than the context that I had grown up in. And so a huge uh, shout out to Mr. Moore, who is who has passed away. He passed away the first year I started uh, Love Beyond Walls, but he was a guy that I could reach out to and ask, you know, should I marry her? Should I put myself through college? Uh, should I think about uh, pursuing uh, nonprofit work? Uh, he became a, a staple in my life, and I was able to overcome a lot of those challenges. Wow. Everybody needs a Mr. Moore, don't we? <laughs> that, that's yeah. uh, Mentoring is such a powerful thing. Yeah, I mean, mentorship affords... Uh, those who are being mentored, the opportunity to uh, get insights, um, to uh, have space where there can be a level or this sense of vulnerability. Um, mentorship al also provides uh, wisdom. Uh, my stepfather says that knowledge is information, but wisdom is application, right? Mm -hmm. um, mentorship uh, provides this, this great sense of wisdom. But it also uh, helps the person who has been mentored find clarity um, because the mentee is able to ask all sorts of questions, uh, whether those questions are related to uh, the mentor's work, uh, specifically if the mentee has desires to do the same type of work that the mentor is doing. Uh, but greater than that, just questions about life. You know, there are tons of things that can be gleaned from sitting with uh, persons who are vulnerable enough to share their existential experiences, uh, where by which Mr. Moore was one of those individuals. I mean, we have so many stories that we could relate to each other uh, with, but greater than that, he was able to mind out uh, the principles in his own story and uh, share those with me. Wow. That's wonderful. So I, I was reading about this experience you had in 2004, where you were, you were walking through to downtown Atlanta and you, and, and you encountered a homeless woman. Uh, and, and that became a powerful kind of moment. T tell us about that. 
Yeah, so I was in my early 20s. Uh, this was around the time when I was starting to, I guess, form uh, the idea of, of, of servant leadership and really trying to figure out my way uh, and how I can insert myself and, and give back not only to the world, but uh, the community that surrounded me. And um, it wasn't easy. Uh, I remember the day uh, my now wife, uh, we were engaged at the time, uh, we were in college, uh, my wife, Cecilia, and I, uh, and we were in our early 20s. Uh, and we were sitting around the apartment um, with our gas tanks nearing the Esan, and we started to complain for a little bit, and then we caught ourselves, and then we started to ask ourselves, what could we do instead of complaining uh, to show up for those in the community that may have it worse off than us? And so we started to notice that we had a lot of excess uh, in terms of clothes uh, lying around the house. Um, and we uh, gather all of those extra items and we stuffed them uh, in, in garbage bags. And we started our, our drive down to the heart of the city uh, here in Atlanta. And we, when we arrived, this is the first time we had ever gone out and just like engaged um, persons uh, living without an address. I remember pulling over to the side of the road and I put on my hazard lights and I see this lady, she's walking down the street barefoot, literally no socks, no shoes. I jump out of the car, I run to the edge of the car near the trunk and I, I opened the trunk and I, I yelled out, excuse me, ma'am, uh, do you know anybody who needs some clothes or shoes or something? Uh, this lady like turns around um, runs towards the car, mind you, with no shoes or socks on, and looks at me and my wife, and she says, I need shoes. I was just praying for shoes last night. And so my wife at that point is like digging in the trash bags and trying to find the pair of shoes that she had placed in there. And it was this old pair of Reeboks to her, but when she pulled them out of the bag, they were like a brand new pair of shoes to the woman who was uh, barefoot. And coincidentally, uh, my wife's size were her size and she put on the shoes. I'll never forget the chills I felt or the chills we felt um, and the long conversation on the ride home, not even just talking about how we wanted to structure our family, uh, being intentional with our own children, but um, we started to talk about what we wanted to give our lives to uh, mm -hmm. in a rhythmic way uh, because you know, uh, events, service and events are cool, right? Um, but service isn't a, an, an event, it's a lifestyle. Mm. Uh, so we kind of uh, got our, like our, our core, a core of who we are and who we, we were being shaped to be uh, out of that experience. That's amazing. And in 2013, you actually formalized uh, the, the kind of the concept and Love Beyond Walls became a nonprofit. And then um, you actually made a decision to live as a homeless person, as a person without a home. Yeah. What happened? Yeah. So, um, I mean, fast forwarding, I was... Um, I've been married to my wife for a number of years. Uh, I overcome a lot of um, the things that were stacked against me earlier in my life. At this point, I had obtained about four degrees. I'm currently working on a PhD. And um, I'll never forget, we always had this rhythm of going downtown and building uh, relationships with community members. And I'll never forget, I was building this relationship with this guy. His name was Kurt. Uh, he used to tell me to call him Kurt Dog. And so Kurt lived behind uh, this abandoned building. And it was kind of fit and stand, but it had a hole in the fence. And there was like tons of trash and, I mean, whatever you could imagine um, that would give you the uh, the anxiety of viruses or whatever it was being uh, in this space. I mean, that was just the setting in which he lived. Uh, used cardboards to lay down, um, donated clothes for a pillow, 
um, and whatever he could find to cover himself up. And it's in the middle of winter and I'm having breakfast with Kurt uh, for a three month uh, period. And around November, I got enough, like, um, I guess, confidence to ask him a little uh, deeper about his story. And Kurt, for the first time, had opened up to me. He hadn't opened up to a counselor or anybody else. And I think one of the reasons why is because I kept showing up because he thought, you know, at some point I was just going to stop showing up to have breakfast with him. Um, and he told me that he had lost his wife and his child in a car accident. Um, he could no longer function on his job, kind of blamed himself, uh, started to use alcohol as a way of coping, um, became depressed and ended up losing everything. And now he's on the backside of this building. Uh, when I saw Kurt, I didn't see someone as not being worthy. I saw someone as being highly deserving of having um, his dignity affirmed. And I, I wanted to show him that by the presence and the proximity that I was bringing to the relationship. And so I asked him, I said, Kurt, man, why don't you allow me to just use some of my contacts, my resources, I could get you into a nearby shelter. He quickly responds, he says, um, there's a shelter close by, 500 guys sleep in chairs. There's only one urinal. Uh, and the smell is so thick, you could probably taste it. He says, as a matter of fact, I probably wouldn't get any sleep um, in this shelter because I would stay up all night trying to uh, protect everything I own and possess in this one bag. And he says, um, why don't you do it? Mm. And I was, stopped, I was stopped in my tracks. And I had to sit with that. And I sat with that on the ride home. And I sat with it at the dinner table until my wife asked me a question. And she says, what's wrong? You seem kind of off. And I say, um, I think Kurt challenged me today. And I, I'm kind of sensing that I should like go through the experience of homelessness on the other side with a bunch of education where I'm more art articulate, where I could advocate more. I said, I, I'm, I'm probably supposed to make myself homeless at this point. And she says, what? I say, yeah, um, but long story short, uh, she agrees. Uh, we agree on a time period and I'll never forget, I was blogging about it and my wife and my two young children at the time are dropping me off underneath the bridge in the midst of uh, an encampment and I didn't take anything. And it was a few days before Christmas. And I had all the people, right, telling me, you're crazy. Um, why would you leave your family during Christmas? And, you know, it's cold. It's too cold out there. They were talking about how the, the temperature would drop below 10 degrees. And what they didn't realize is that I was trying to model to my kids that it's better to be a gift than receive one. Right. Um, and it was just a perfect um, opportunity to display that action, not only for my children, but to show up for a community uh, that was invisible uh, to many people during this time. Wow. And so how, what was it like, like practically speaking for you to be on the street? Yeah, well, <clears throat> I did it on two separate occasions at, at a total of a, a little over a month, about a month and a half. Uh, I mean, being put out of shelters, um, you know, being in cold weather where, you know, some nights we would have to stand around a fire pit and literally throw donated clothes into the pit because there's no firewood. Um, I remember, you know, walking tons and tons of miles just to either use the restroom or try to charge my phone. Uh, being put out of restaurants, uh, walking down the streets with some of my friends without an address and watching business professionals walk across the street to try to duck and dodge us. I remember one time uh, a person had bought everybody in the group a cup of coffee so we could sit inside of this restaurant because it was freezing cold outside. And, you know, this family that was sitting across from us didn't even know that I wasn't actually homeless at this time. I was just among my friends, um, but I was going through the experience. Family gets up, uh, gives us this like really, really, um, dehumanizing stare and walks away and moves to the other side of the restaurant. 
And so, <clears throat> you know, there were times when I would be on the corner even begging for dollars with one of my friends who had a terminal illness and it wasn't for drugs or alcohol, it was, it was because he needed medication, right? Um, and having all of the, you know, explicit slurs thrown out of the window. Um, we had people throw beer cans and cans at us and lock the doors and turn away and all of that stuff. And it was this very weird contrast because while I'm going through all of these experiences of being overlooked and pushed aside and it's like this community rallied together and they got me a tent and a blanket and whenever there was a meal that showed up they would be so willing to share I mean one night uh, I was sleeping and it was maybe 10 degrees with the wind chill uh, all the way all the way down to three degrees and it's raining and my toes and shoes are wet my toes feel like popsicles I can't even sleep and I come out of the tent and uh, my friend Tony is standing around the fire and I, I turn to him and I say, how do you make it when your, your toes are just freezing cold? Tony doesn't say anything. Uh, I, I call him the man of action. He just walks over to his tent, grabs a pair of socks, which were his last donated pair of socks, walks back over to me and hands them to me and say, you'll make it. Um, so it was this weird contrast of how you know, in many ways, there was this community that was being overlooked. Um, and there were so many different unique stories. Um, and me learning that homelessness is not monolithic. Um, and there are people who literally have nothing that would give everything. But then there are people that we would encounter that had access to everything that would give absolutely nothing. And it's just a powerful message. Wow. That's incredible. You mentioned something in here that, and that I think is amazing that, that we really need to look at these folks as people and not problems. And that is such a powerful sentence. Um, but talk about that because I'm sure as you were home, you know, kind of on the streets yourself, deciding to do that and then in all of your work over the last 15 years or whatever it's been you've you've gotten to know the people you know the the kurt and tony and these you know that, that you're talking about as people and not not prob not statistics not a problem to be solved but as a person to be loved i mean talk about talk about your experience and how that has impacted you yeah, I mean, I, I normally start with a rhetorical question where I ask, what if you were known for the worst moment or worst right. time in your life? You know, right. uh, if, if people were to sit um, and watch in the background and watch you struggle through, I mean, most of the times we get a chance to mask our problems or go through things uh, in a community. Um, which is highly contrasted to the experience of homelessness because uh, one of the greatest challenges is the lack of social capital. Um, you know, people are displaced from their families. Uh, people are uh, displaced from people who they can consider friends. Uh, I mean, even during COVID-19, uh, we were out in the, in the middle of a campaign. Uh, I mean, for a number of weeks, there were people in parks not even having access to hand uh, sanitizer or hand washing. Uh, there was little information disseminated amongst this group about what COVID-19 actually was. Um, and then we would encounter, you know, persons and, and they would say, you know, I miss my friends, uh, people who would commute back and forth. I have no one that, to talk to, you know, uh, so, even the, the whole term or the notion, you know, social distancing, right? I don't really like that term. I think we should reframe it. Uh, we, we've been physical distancing because people experiencing homelessness have been socially distant long before uh, a pandemic. And, you know, I think that is something to consider and something that we can all relate to because we all know what it means or feels like to be overlooked, to be passed by, to be unseen right? 
to not have something or part of ourselves that we want validated, validated. Maybe it's in your family, maybe it's on your job, maybe it's in your community, et cetera. Whatever that, the, uh, the anxiety or the, uh, the, 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 the void that you feel when this happens, imagine that in the context of homelessness and feeling that every single second. You know, like my friend Tyrus who would say, you know, pe many people fear us, but they don't know what the other side of fear does to my self-esteem. I'm a husband, I'm a father, I'm a brother, I'm an uncle, I'm somebody's son, I'm Tyrus. And when you fear me, uh, that actually does more damage to my worth and how I mm -hmm. see myself. Um, that fear, yes, can be positive and it can you know, help us to be aware of things that uh, we should be aware of to protect ourselves from hurt, harm, and, or danger. Uh, but in many ways, fear can also be a negative mm -hmm. uh, because the way that we see other people uh, uh, falsely can invoke a fear that can be also damaging to that same person. And it's important for us to, you know, see people, affirm people's inherent dignity, uh, knowing that we can't give anybody dignity, we can only affirm it. And um, realizing that uh, this idea of home, if we take another definition of it, home is a place where you feel seen, accepted, and you feel like you belong. And so far beyond a, a roof or four walls and far beyond the, the most beautiful edifice, uh, home is a place that we create and how we treat other people. Hmm. What was your mentor's name again? Uh, Mr. Moore. Mr. Moore. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, um, you know, it's so counterintuitive. The idea I had, I, cause it, interestingly, I had, you know, somebody I look up to a mentor, kind of a person in my life who, who told me one time, if you're getting, if you're low on money, go give something away. It's it, 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 like your experience with the, when you're sitting with Cecilia and your, you know, your gas tanks nearing empty, but you're, but the, but you went to give some stuff away and it blossomed into this unbelievable work lifestyle. Um, it's so counterintuitive, but it's amazing. You know, I mean, you you feel like you're, you know, not doing well, so go give something away. So anyway, I, I think that's a powerful thing. Um, what is your vision, Terrence? I know next time I see, I'm going to have to call you Dr. Terrence Lester, but it sounds like, but what, what's your vision here for, I mean, you, you've walked to the White House, you've, did, you've done COVID uh, sanitation stations with Lecrae, you've, you've got your hands in a lot of areas here, but what, what's the future best you can tell? Yeah, well, you know, our vision uh, for the organization is to create a world where no one is invisible. Um, as that is connected to the issue of homelessness, uh, we are trying to create more empathy around the subject, uh, educating people that uh, homelessness is not monolithic, that homelessness is much bigger than a few guys and gals that you may see on a street corner or underneath the bridge, that homelessness itself is a global issue. There are over 150 million people uh, in the world um, that don't have a place to stay. That's a lot of people. And I kind of oh. borrow or you know use the framework of ML King's uh, philosophy when he calls this a world house, you know, really having uh, this heart and posture to see the world as our address, right? Um, and so we want to do more work in, um, you know, decriminalizing what it means to, to live without an address. Uh, we want to continue to provide shelter, but most importantly, we're, we're trying to raise up more leaders uh, around the country and partner with more leaders uh, to equip them uh, with the necessary education and also ideas and, and tools uh, that is needed to show up in their communities. I mean, because when you think about it right now, uh, disparity is at an all time high, uh, but funding is, is low. Uh, you know, there's more work 
than we can, you know, actually give ourselves to. And volunteerism is low, right? Um, you know, there are so many people right now that are facing facing e evictions, and researchers are suggesting that by 2023, there'll be a 45 percent increase in in homelessness, right? Uh, based wow. upon what we've gone through with COVID-19. And so it's to, it's to stay consistent, but it's also to lock arms with other practitioners on the ground, people who we can collaborate with and build synergy to continue to build a more empathetic world. Because at the end of the day, um, you know, I think if people continue to, to feel invisible, it's only because we've forgotten that belonging is a critical aspect of our humanity. Yeah, so beautiful. What a wonderful, I could talk with you for an hour, but we're out of time, but this is powerful. Uh, congratulations, it's beautiful, it's inspiring. Mr. Moore is smiling somewhere, uh, but thank you for sharing it with us and for everything you're doing. Yeah, thank you, Dean. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you today. God bless you, man. God bless thanks. you. All right. Thanks, Dean. Thanks, team. Yeah. Thank you. thank you. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. We'll see you next time. I feel a bit caught in between at times because, like I've told my children for years, when God calls you to be a bridge, you have to expect that you're going to get stepped on every now and then. Likely that, that a traumatized person will cause more trauma. It's also true that a cherished person will be able to find their way to the joy there is in cherishing themselves and others. The notion of justice and fairness just always appealed to me. Justice was my calling, not just a career. Pursuing justice uh, for the poor and less privileged has been like the greatest adventure of my life. Find a mentor, find a coach. Because mm -hmm. in the coach there is the man who's climbed the mountain, you just begin, or summited the mountain, you just begin to climb. It's just wisdom. That's I just beautiful. want people to to become friends with the author so that they can have that perspective on life and realize that they were made on purpose, for a purpose, and they're on the stage of the world right now to play an important role. Mm -hmm. If you want something, you have to really articulate what it is. You have to say it out loud, and then you have to be willing to receive that too and, and be willing to feel that you're worthy of receiving that. Partisan legislatures in Congress are meant to debate. Right to be passionate sure. about your differences, different right. points of views. Right. But they're not supposed to be such that you hate one another or that yeah. you demagogue one another. You know, and that's the great thing about it because nobody's better than anybody else. We all got the moment of today, of right now, to be the best person that we can be and, and most importantly, you know, take the gift that we've been given and give it away to other people, because I know I can't keep it unless I give it away. I guess uh, just to build knowledge and awareness of it, just so people can yeah. have a better understanding of what it is, you know, I think having those conversations uh, builds empathy, and with empathy comes solidarity. When I see positive things happen in the world, when I, when I see stories that uh, young kids, um, something fantastic happens to them, those are the good things in life, yeah. and when you can do things like that that you can help someone maybe achieve some of their goals in life. This is Good Life. I'm Dean Wilson. I, I encourage you to stay tuned for, for today's program. Dave O'Dell is with me. He's the athletic director at Westmont College. He's also an entrepreneur, a businessman, and he's just got a lot of great stories and thoughts to share. I think you're going to really enjoy it. Dave O'Dell is on The Good Life coming up next. Welcome to Good Life, I'm Dean Wilson. So glad you joined us today. Uh, I have a special guest today, Dave O'Dell is with me. Dave is a friend, he is a business executive, entrepreneur, also an athletic director here in Santa Barbara, California at Westmont College. So he's an interesting, amazing guy. Dave, welcome. Thank you. Thank so you, first Dean. of all, I'll, I'll say, so Dave's dad, Bill, was the head basketball coach at Azusa Pacific University for 16 years, coached for 39 years total. At six, in his 16 years at Azusa Pacific, I think his winning percentage was 804 or something, something really high. Um, so I want to start by apologizing 
<laughs> because I heckled Bill a fair amount <laughs> as a Westmont student. <laughs> I mean, like a lot. So if you, if Bill, if you're watching, I'm sorry. <laughs> and on behalf of all Westmont students, you know, the sit down Bill chant. <laughs> So I just want to clear the air. That's I've, good. I've been having that on my shoulders for a while. Yeah, time. as the Westmont Athletic Director, I appreciate that. <laughs> uh -huh. That wasn't the worst of our chants, actually. <laughs> like back in the day, like some of our chants were a little. Yeah, uh, you couldn't get away with that. Couldn't now. do that now. No, yeah. no, we would have had to kick you out. <laughs> right, right. I probably would have got tossed a few times. Um, yeah. So Bill O'Dell's an amazing guy himself, and I actually wanted to start with that. Hmm. Tell me about your father-son relationship with your dad. Yeah. Well, first off. Um, just unconditional love. Yeah. Um, and uh, that's, that was the foundation for our relationship and that I never doubted that for a moment. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's, a, he's an amazing human in that he is very, very consistent. Um, he didn't have a ton of words, but when he spoke them, uh, they impact they were impactful mm -hmm. and uh, and then um, you know the greatest blessing really in my life is that I got to stand and sit by his side from the time I was five years old to the time I left for Westmont mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I sat at the end of every bench for almost every game is since right? I was five years old I uh, got to be essentially teammates with different set of guys every year in Long Beach and wow. uh, learned a ton from that experience um, about life and you know about growing up in a very very diverse uh, area of Long Beach mm -hmm. and different um, you know lifestyles and different uh, you know ways people lived and um, and got to be there got to ride the bus with the team Wow uh, got to sit in at the halftime talks um, for really, you know, 13 years. Wow. Um, and so th that uh, it had has been so formative, was so formative. Oh, for I me. bet. Yeah. Was he at Millican? Long Beach Millican, yes. So he was there for like 20 years? Yes, yes. Okay, so when you were, uh, yeah. and then he, and then after you left for Westmont, then yeah. he ended up going to Azusa? Right, right. He, okay. I think 90, I was at Westmont, he was never at Westmont while I was at West. I mean, never at Azusa while I was at Westmont. Okay. I think '91 was his first year at Azusa. I graduated okay. Westmont in '89. Okay. Okay. So I can remember I played my very last game at Westmont. We lost in the district uh, tournament, and got a ride from from an old friend Garrett O'Hara from our game, our Westmont game to the LA Sports Arena to watch my dad win the CF championship. Is that right? Yeah. So wow. that was a special. Did he night. have a preference? Did he, what did he like? I mean, I'm sure it's a hard question to answer, but did, was a high school coaching experience for him versus the, the college coaching experience? Did he have a preference in terms of the 20 years in high school or at Milken versus the 16 years? Yeah, the I think it was, you know, he, he, he and my mom treated that as their ministry and you know really serving uh youth and so um obviously millican being a public school was very different in that you know what what you could do and then you go to azusa and at this christian right. school and it was very you know you could, could be very upfront about right. things and talk right. about things that way so it was very different very different yeah. and i would say um you know he has great relationships with with athletes that he coached at both places. In fact, he just went to last year, had a big gathering of a group of guys from the 70s at Millican, and they met at a Laker game in a box. And uh, it was really? just one of those things that when you're a retired coach, it was such a blessing Doesn't for him. Doesn't get better than that. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, but the, yeah. Zusa, the Zusa relationships, because you get four years with them right. and you recruited them and all that, those, right. those relationships are more sort of, you know, lifelong and more day-to-day -day like relationships yeah. that he still has. That makes sense. So. And we were talking before we came on about Jeff Rudder, one of your dad's uh, old assistants, who yes. I know he's dear friends with. He was one of my high school uh, teammates and good friends. Um, so he was the athletic director at Azusa Pacific as well as the head coach and for then, a time yes for a time yeah. and then and then you be, you became the athletic director at Westmont correct and as i was reading for this interview i was kind of looking at his story and yours his track record as a 
AD in terms of the whatever the award is for the GSAC, GSAC All Sports, the All yeah. Sports, and then yours, <laughs> which is no slouch. Um, I think eight eight years in a row or something is what I read that that in, that you've won that award as AD. Yes, and I can't believe it's already been eleven years since you've been AD. Yeah, it's has gone by quick, very quick. Yeah, yeah. but so tell me about so y your dad coach AD. You were a player, yeah. you're a businessman, and we'll get to that in a minute, but tell me about what it's been like to be the athletic director at Westmont College, and also, what is your vision for the student athlete right. there? Right, that's a great, great question. So, so first, interesting quick story. So the reason I decided to do the AD thing is because I thought it was gonna be a cool way to hang out with my dad, because he was still the AD at Azusa. Oh, okay. And so the first three years, or two or three years I was AD, he was still AD at APU. Okay. In fact, that, that award, the All Sports Award, has been in our family for something like 20 years, <laughs> because he had it, and <laughs> That's the amazing. first year he was gone, we won it, and so That's anyway, so, yeah, so we, we laugh about that. That's so someday fantastic. somebody will get it from us. Is there us. a trophy? Yeah, it's a, there's a, the it's a really cool The just own that trophy. Yeah, it's, I love it's, it. it goes That's to really... each school, and it's wow. funny because it has Azusa, 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 and then it says Westmont, 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 Westmont. Wow. It's pretty cool. That is awesome. So anyway, so we had a blast um, being in these business meetings, you know, right. for the conference together, right. and uh, and he taught me so much just to do that job. And, yeah. uh, and so I was always able to bounce. And then when he retired, it was even better because I could bounce a lot of things off of him. Oh, right. right. Yeah, our, our vision for athletes at Westmont is that they have a life-changing experience through athletics. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and we believe that, you know, the, the, all the pillars of Westmont, that, you know, this, this liberal arts education, where you've got to do all that, and there's no free ride for athletes at Westmont right. um, as it relates right. to academics, and you got to play a sport at a really high level and practice and that time commitment, right. and you got to you got to spend time to nurture your faith and all the things that Westmont brings in that regard, right. and and so we we see sort of the final product after four years as this super well-rounded person that's had some had some challenges, had some adversity, mm -hmm. had to dig in and do a lot of things well. Right. Um, and, uh, and we think that that, that experience really has an, uh, has an impact on them. And you, and you know that as much as anybody. Uh, yeah, well, it was a great experience for me. I was not a good baseball player and it took up a lot of time. So I retired, <laughs> <laughs> but, it was, but the Westmont experience is phenomenal. For people that don't know or are watching this somewhere else, Westmont College is a private Christian college in the hills of Santa Barbara, California. 1,200 or so students with an outstanding everything, in my opinion. Um, and I'm not just saying that because Gail Beebe is going to be here in a couple of weeks. Oh, okay. I mean it. It's an outstanding. And our family has been blessed by Westmont a lot. But you've won a lot. It's interesting in that answer, winning didn't come up. And I know you, you want to win. Mm -hmm. But the other stuff is more important. And so how have you managed to win so much? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, so um, we, we think that winning is, is a great metric for how we're doing. Um, if we're doing things well, we're going to win games. Um, one of the first things I did being a business guy is I, I created this giant spreadsheet. And I, I wanted to see what our win losses were as an entire program, all sports. And uh, when I became AD, we'd won 41% of our contests the previous year. Um, and uh, we started instituting some changes, a wide range, range of changes. And uh, like what? Uh, well, we did a number of things. We, well, you know, initially there were some coaching changes right, um, right away. Right. Um, we, uh, we instituted um, a captain's retreat that, um, where we sort of poured into the captains and helped them, mm. you know, do that job well. Right. Um, Great idea. Uh, so that was important. We, we started a tradition of an all-athlete meeting uh, where we pulled all the athletes together um, every year we pick uh, a verse of the year 
mm. um, and a theme for the year around that we want the whole program to adopt um, as as all 250 athletes, not just team by team. Yeah. Wow. Um, and uh, and we really talked a lot about each team supporting other teams. So we came up like with brother sister teams. Mm. Um, we did some things like that, and and we got. Um, we got each team cheering for each other yeah. and feeling like part of something bigger than just their 12 guys on a basketball floor or 30 guys on a baseball field, right. um, that they actually had could have an impact on how the school did in total. And so I, I told my coaches, I said, I don't care where the wins come from. They can come from women's soccer, men's basketball. I just want wins. And so if, if, if your program is going to get wins, that's you know, that's showing me that the metric is right. And if you're doing it in the right way, of course. Right. right. So uh, that first year we won 41 percent of the, the first year we won, like we we're right at where we were before. It was a rough first year. And then it just started creeping up. And uh, so now it's interesting because we're always flirting around 75 percent. Really? Yeah. And the last probably three, four years we've been in the 75 percent range across all sports. Um, obviously, That's you can't amazing. take into account track cross country because they don't do head to head stuff. But but you're pretty uh, good in track. Uh, yeah, but those track? are good too. So yeah, Russell Smelly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So wow. Uh, so anyway, so that that kind of focus on the full program versus these little siloed things. Um, That's fantastic. Yeah, I think so. You kind of viewed it as a as one collective program. Yeah. Not individual teams. Correct. That's really yeah. smart. I think our coaches also appreciated that. And there's a great camaraderie within the staff. Um, Is there? And they support each other. And now that we have some, some older coaches and some younger coaches, that relationship, those are really cool relationships that are developing. And, and That's uh, really good. Yeah. So there's a lot of like like informal mentoring that are going on right now in the program. So it's, wow. it's great. And um, Dave Wolf still there? Dave Wolf is still there and won, it, won a legend. conference championship last year. And, yeah. And how many, know. is he 32 years or something? I think it's it's in that range. I've lost, yeah. He and Smelly, I've lost count. Smelly's a, <laughs> yeah, I, 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 yeah I'm, he might be in triple digits. <laughs> yeah. I don't even know where exactly. Smelly's. And what a, you mentioned the name Russell Smelly to people. It's amazing yeah. the, the, what people just, the respect he's earned over time oh, and yeah. the impact he's had. And, and, and Dave Wolf and John Moore and and of course uh, Coach Ruiz has just taken the baseball program now and lit it on fire. Yeah, that um, I tell a lot of people that uh, Rob Ruiz, who was my first hire, um, made me look. Was he like, really? Yeah, he made me look like, <laughs> like a, a genius, genius. <laughs> because right. you know that you program. Got him from Azusa, right? And, well, so that's the thing is all I did to get him was I picked up the phone and said, "Dad, I need a baseball coach." <laughs> And he said, I got a baseball coach for you. Is and that he, right? Because he was the associate head coach at Azusa. Oh, he wasn't the head coach. He was the associate head coach. Yeah, under Paul Sfagdis, who's still there. Oh, okay. Uh, but your dad knew about him. Uh, well, yeah, because he, yeah, he worked un under my dad, yeah. Wow. Yeah, so my dad said, yeah, Robert's ready for a head coaching job. And uh, we had a full search, but he, you know, he nailed it. Yeah, and, he was the one. Yeah, he's the one. And, and, and he's, he's really progressed. Um, He's helping me with athletic administration. I really lean Is on really? him uh, in the AD stuff. He handles a number of things that, given my roles, I, I can't get to. Right. Um, but he does it so well. And That's and great. Just so you started one for one in the head coaching <laughs> yeah. deal. Yeah. That's great. I also lit the baseball program on fire, literally. You did? Can I tell you a quick story? Okay. So we did this. We decided to go down to the baseball field at night. Uh-huh. Um, and douse baseballs in gasoline, put them on the tee, and then hit them. Okay. Seemed like the right thing to do at the time. Yes. <laughs> well, Why wouldn't it be? <laughs> right. So I was a freshman. Uh, again, freshman on the team, not a good player, no power at all fields, um, how, how I've described my hitting. So I, I am in charge of the gas can, and somehow... I got like way too close and the fire went this way. Uh oh. So we had like a a big problem. Security <laughs> arrives. We go bolting in like six different directions. <laughs> I just remember jumping some fence like 
in the right field down the right field line. So I lit the baseball program on fire also. Yeah. Like Robert. You did. Just in a different way. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Was, was, who was that was the coach? highlight of my baseball career was that Kirkard night. Was Kirkard your coach? Kirkard was my coach. Okay. The great John Kirkard, who yeah. I'm still good friends with to He's this day. He's a great guy. Legendary, he, wonderful man. He's been so supportive of Robert. I Has think he? that that's... That's had a huge impact on our program too. Oh, it's just great. the support that we still get from John. He's that's, so loved. And so is. I, when I was playing basketball at Westmont, all my buddies were baseball players who played for Kirkguard. Oh, really? So I went to every baseball game. So I love John. Yeah, too, John so. Kirkguard's a great guy. Yeah. Let's talk about John Moore. Okay. John Moore retired, yeah. and, and he's 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 finished as the head coach, and he's he, my understanding is he's moving kind of into an associate athletic director. Or he may stick around. Right. In some capacity, but reflect on his career, and yeah. I know you guys have been friends a long time, and yeah, reflect so, on that. So so. I, I actually grew up, I had seen John play high school and oh, really? uh, at Los Alamitos. Your dad. Well, yeah, because we, Los Alamitos, where John played, is actually really close to Millican. And so, oh, really? yeah, so I had an occasion to see he and his, and his brother Mike play uh, in their years at Los Alamitos. Oh, nice. So, I didn't know um, that. And then, um, and then I watched John play at Westmont because uh, we used to go to the local Westmont games. And then okay. John coached at Fresno when I played for Chet Cameron oh, at really? Westmont. And so, yeah, a lot of years with John. Yeah. And, um, and uh, you know, I think there's a couple things that, I mean, there's so many things, but there's a couple things that really stand out to me about John is just, one, his, his relationship with the community. And mm -hmm. I don't mean just the Westmont community. For, for one, he's loved by the professors. Um, and he's a coach that just really embraced that faculty coach model mm. and uh, really, I think, uh, helped the athletic department and helped me as an AD in terms of credibility with the faculty because there's always a little bit of tension right, between right, athletics right. and the faculty. Right. And uh, John, I think, was instrumental in sort of bridging that Russell's another guy who fits in that category right. but um, so I, I would say that and then you know, some of the things that you know really I think West Westmont stands where it does in this community in terms of the greater Santa Barbara community because of John's interaction with the community and um, I don't know if you follow the Santa Barbara Athletic yeah. Roundtable yeah, yeah. But, but John is, they always have John be the last guy to speak at that lunch during basketball season. And he goes every Monday and, um, and he just represents the college so well right. in that environment. Yeah. And like the, the, you know, people just eat it up, but he also does a great job of sharing what's special about Westmont mm -hmm. to, to the greater Santa Barbara community. Right. And if I had to pick one thing that I just think, you know, will go beyond what he accomplished as a coach and what he accomplished with certain players and so forth, it would be that he he really did um, sort of help Westmont. I mean, when you think about it, he's he outlived a lot of presidents at Westmont. Right. And so his right. name and face in the community um, was the Westmont coach yeah, and right. so what a great ambassador he was for all these years yes. in that regard so true yeah. so true we he was he was here a few weeks ago we had a great time talking reflecting and talking about I loved that episode oh, because I loved when you threw out names and he was right, like right, coming right. up the with each right, one that right, was right. good that well was good. and then the Jeff A's I mean he almost brought me to tears. I mean, I'm just talking about A's. I mean, 26 years together. Yeah. And just that story. That's just such a powerful story of, uh, you know, on Azen's part of kind of just servant. Yeah. Servant's heart. Yeah. And just the way that they, you know, love each other. Yeah. It's powerful. Yeah. Well, so that's all on the Westmont athletic director side. I want to talk about your, your, your career. I want to talk about, well, let's start with Medbridge. Okay. And um, w when I was, you know, here years and years ago, it was it was, it was always Dave O'Dell was associated with the Tynan Group. Mm -hmm. That was the name in my head. And yeah. Now it's Medbridge. But tell us, I, I read a little bit about Medbridge, but for somebody who's watching, what, what does Medbridge do? Right. So so what we do is we partner with um, surgeons, uh, physicians that that specialize in surgery. And we develop and then part, partner with and develop and manage outpatient surgery centers. 
So, oh. um, so imagine a doctor, you know, needing to do your ACL reconstruction because you blew out your knee playing basketball. Um, most of my centers are, are orthopedic in nature. So my partners are mostly orthopedic surgeons. You've probably heard of Dr. Ryu right. locally, yep. um, is a well-known surgeon. Yep. So I did my first surgery center in Santa Barbara at uh, called Summit Surgery Center right across the street from the hospital. And we, we did it because um, the doctors wanted to specialize their surgical environment. And instead of going to the hospital where you've got all different kinds of specialties going on and you might be doing a, you know, a hernia repair at eight o'clock and at nine o'clock an ACL and at 10 o'clock some heart procedure. Right. They wanted to be able to specialize huh. and they wanted to be able to buy the highest tech equipment. They wanted their staff in the operating room, the tech, the circulating nurses to be specialized in what they did. So it was at the time, this was, you know, late 90s, there were only 400 surgery centers in America, and now they're 5,000. Is that right? And, um, and in fact, um, Medicare has really leaned on the surgery center industry to, to reduce the costs in the Medicare system. Oh. So, um, in fact, over the last couple of years, we're now doing uh, total joints in an outpatient setting um, for Medicare patients. Wow. And, uh, and we've We've played an instrumental role during the pandemic because you know surgeries haven't been able to get done in the hospital because they've been saving oh, right. beds. Right. So COVID. we've actually been taking on more cases at the surgery center. Wow. Um, and so, so my my company Medbridge, we we put together the doctors who partner together, we develop the surgery centers, and then we hire the staff and we manage it. So we do all the business function, all the billing and the collections and all the Medicare certification, all the state and federal guidelines following. And then the surgeons just do schedule surgery. their cases and they do their surgery. And wow. um, from a business model standpoint, we get a facility fee, just like the hospital would get a fee. Yep. And it's an opportunity for the doctors to make a little more money because they're partners in the entity. So they- the doctors who work there are partners in the business. Exactly. That is the surgery center. Exactly. So instead wow. of just making their professional fee, right. they get a little cut of the profit of the surgery center. Wow. Um, and so it um, it's really interesting because as reimbursements have dropped, meaning doctors are getting paid less now yep. than they ever have, yep. um, they are really relying on these ancillary revenues like, like outpatient surgery. So wow. um, anyways, the other cool thing about it is Dr. Ryu is a great example. He used to say, you know, I would get done with my operative day at eight o'clock and be happy if I got home to see my kids because of the backups that happen in a hospital with triage cases that need to get put on. And once we opened the surgery center, he was done by two every day. And wow. it allowed him to have a little more balance in his life, you know, yeah. Uh, and wow. all that. So um, interesting. So that's the business. Um, we have 15 different surgery centers that we are partners in or provide services to across California. Um, and they're but they're not called Medbridge. The, they're the they're centers. all named separate entities. Okay. They all have different ownerships. We're the we're the sort of the operating group. I see. And we're owners in most of them. And so uh, yeah, it's a it's an interesting business and and uh, one that. I sort of stumbled into. Uh, yeah, I was going to ask you, how, how did that happen? Well, so I'm a CPA by trade, right. uh, so I had gone that route, and you know about switching careers. <laughs> yeah, I do. You know? uh, I did love it, um, and uh, John Tynan, my current partner, uh, asked me to come help him with Tynan Group, which he had just started. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that we did was we bought a building by, by the hospital just as an investment, and it happened to be occupied by a number of orthopedic surgeons. And oh. they, so I was their landlord. And they came and they said, we'd love for you to build us a surgery center. And I said, what's that? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and they explained it to me. I said, okay, let's try it. And so I did one and I thought, okay, we'll just go back to our knitting. And, and, uh, yeah. and then about a year and a half later, I got a call from a very prominent Bay Area surgeon named Eugene Wolf. Um, who actually was probably the first, uh, the, the, he's sort of known for a particular knee and shoulder procedure, 
um, asked me to develop his surgery center, and then it kind of just snowballed from wow. there. Wow, and you have 15 now. Yeah, yeah. And they're all in California? They're all in California. We have one um, that we're working on out of state um, right now, but, but really focused on California, just because I, I never wanted to have to take two planes to get anywhere. Right, yeah, right. <laughs> so we have a Bay Area presence, but pretty much everything is down here. Yeah, we have yeah. three in the surgery. In the, in that the is really interesting. Uh, I've been thinking a lot about culture, uh -huh. just in companies and anywhere. Yeah. What's the, what have you learned? You've been in business a long time. You've been an athletic director a long time now. Um, what have you learned about culture in a workplace in a that is important to you? Yeah, that's a great question, and and that I think um, what what uh, employees um, expect from a culture, from a company is very different today than it even was five years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so we're constantly sort of evolving mm -hmm. as it relates to culture. Um, I think that one thing that is for sure, and, and I think long-term wise, is I've tried to build um, culture around service. Mm -hmm. Everything I, that I've been involved with professionally has been about making the people that we serve better and able to focus on their trade, whether it be Dr. Marcus Elliott at P3, mm -hmm. um, helping him be able to spend more time in the science of sports, mm -hmm. helping uh, Dr. Ryu be able to spend more time in surgery where mm -hmm. he really is helping patients versus administrative right. things, whether it, it's keeping my coaches with their athletes right. and on the floor coaching them versus having to do other administrative tasks that you know so so i've sort of built the focus of my cultures around service yeah and um but i think that the 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 big thing that needs to happen in culture whether it be an athletic program or a business is creating um meaning around what what mission is and what what each person that shows up how what they're doing helps others changes the world changes their community mm -hmm. it gives them something more than am i just doing this for a paycheck right or if i just doing this for another trophy um right. more around like what are, what am i doing for humanity yeah. or the kingdom or you right. know, what have you Dave, thanks for coming by. I'm sure we'll have you on again thanks, uh, sometime down the road. This but has been great. Great talking with you. Good and we'll see you next time.